Coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Waylon Bailey. I want to talk with you about renewing your devotion to God. For saying again, God, I am in. This is my commitment. This is how I want to live. I want to be faithful. If no one else is faithful, I want to be faithful. How do we get to that point? It is amazing what is said in the prophecy of Daniel. It is amazing what God revealed. When you look at Scripture and when you look at time periods, remember, uh, there was a, the, a time period of Scripture of almost 2,000 years, and you see times in which God revealed himself in, in very large ways. And so you have times of, of great miracles that are happening because God is making himself known. So you want to look at Daniel with that in mind. Uh, the events of the prophecy of Daniel fit squarely with the events of the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem. Daniel was in Babylon. Daniel and his three friends, probably a lot more than that, but their three who are mentioned and named, were taken as captives by Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's army in 605 B.C. It was about the same time that Jehoiakim, the king in Jerusalem, was taking the scribe that Baruch had written at the dictation of Jeremiah and as it was read, cut it up with his penknife and threw it in the fire. All of those things happened contemporaneously. So Daniel is taken to Babylon. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel is, is uh, negotiating, pleading for, to be able to practice his faith and pleading and crying out to God, and God made it possible for him to do so. In Daniel chapter 2, there's a crisis that occurs. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, and here's a man arrogant, uh, proud in every way, thinks of him as a god. Most ancient kings did. Most ancient emperors did. Nero, who executed Paul and Peter within a two-year period of time, thought of himself as a god and treated other people as, as property. Nebuchadnezzar put a statue up and, uh, in chapter 3, but in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, called his wise men together. By this time, Daniel is one of his wise men. He calls his wise men together, and he doesn't tell them the dream. He says, tell me the dream, and then give me the interpretation. His wise men, of course, say, well, nobody can do that. Uh, but Nebuchadnezzar was wise enough to know, if you don't know the dream, how do I know you know the interpretation? So he was adamant. You tell me the dream, then you can tell me the interpretation. If you tell me the dream, I'll believe the interpretation. If not, you're going to die. Well, Daniel was one of those men. He cried out to God, pleaded with God. He got Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He brought them together, and he called on them to pray, and he said, we're going to cry out unto God and ask for the mercy of God. And God gave him the dream, then gave him the interpretation that exalted Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael in, in the land of Babylon. And in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar put up a huge statue in honor of himself, and demanded that everyone fall down and worship the gods 
of Babylon and the idol. And a long time before this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had settled the issue. And they refused to bow down. Well, just like in America today, they got ratted on. And uh, what are you going to do, king? They're not, they belong to you. They serve you, and they're not doing this. What are, what are you going to do? So chapter 3, verse 13, picks up the events. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear all of these musical instruments, the horn, the flute, the harp, the pipe, all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. He's giving them a second chance. I'm going to let you decide. If you do that, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Now think about this. Here's what Nebuchadnezzar in his arrogance is saying. Your life is in my hand. I can give you a thumbs up or I can give you a thumbs down. Your life is in my hand. No God, if you don't bow down, no God can rescue you. Think about how arrogant that is. No God can rescue you. So listen to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. I love that little statement. Because God will defend us. And our faith will defend us. And what we believe and what we've put our lives on will defend us. We don't have to defend ourselves in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And notice what they're saying. Now, they're very respectful. And I, I think that's exactly the way Christians ought to be, very respectful. They are very respectful, but they say, our God is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us. And you might also put it this way, and he can deliver us from your hand. You think, well, they didn't say this, you think it's all about you. You think you're the power in the universe. We worship the God of all gods and the king of all kings. And you read through the book of Daniel, and Daniel has it revealed to him. God gives him and tells him about an eternal kingdom that will never be destroyed. I serve the king of an eternal kingdom, and so do you. And they say, he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. You know the question there ought to be? Where do you get men like this? These are three people you'll know in heaven, and we will celebrate their faith. And we will celebrate what God did within them in heaven. Where do people like that come from? Where, where do people come from who in the worst of times do the best of things? Where in a time in which everyone is turning away from God, they turn toward God? Where do those people come from? But an even more, talk about relevance, an even more relevant question is this. How do I get to be that person who is devoted? 
I want to talk with you about renewing your devotion to God. For saying again, God, I am in. This is my commitment. This is how I want to live. I want to be faithful. If no one else is faithful, I want to be faithful. How do we get to that point? How did these men get to that point? Well, I want to give you five things. There must be 55 of these, but I want to give you five things that helps make us devoted people, that renews our devotion, that calls us to faith and obedience, and to be willing to stand tall in the midst of persecution and opposition and anger and blasphemy toward God. How do we live for God faithfully in that kind of day? I want to tell you this. If you and I live faithfully, we're not alone. In Nigeria, in Sudan, in a lot of places of the world, in China. In China, the church is under siege. And the martyrs You know what the word martyr means? It means witness. Uh, The martyrs are witnessing to us of the truth of God and the truth of his word. Nobody, Nobody dies for a man who died and is in the tomb today. But they die for a risen Savior who is Christ the Lord and who lives in our hearts and who calls us to faith and obedience. And they are witnessing for us of the truth of God's word and the majesty of what God does in our lives. What makes those kind of people What makes for those faithful believers around the world under such pressure and under such oppression? How do you do that? So let me give you five things. The number one, the one that I put first for a reason, is time in the presence of God. It is spending time with God. Now, if you read through Daniel this afternoon or sometime this week, here's what you're going to find. That in the book of Daniel, Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were men of prayer. And they weren't the only ones. There were many like them. They're just the ones names. They were people who prayed. When Daniel is trying to discern the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, here's, here's what he does. He, he, he gets his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men. And during the night that night, the Lord, they pleaded with God. They prayed fervently. And God came to them. The Lord came to them and gave them these great words of God. So Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise. They were men of prayer. If you look at chapter 10, Daniel is praying, crying out to God. And if you don't read anything else, you want to read chapter 10. It's the visit of the angel of the Lord unto unto Daniel. And then another angel comes and speaks to him. And then Michael, the archangel, come, archangel, comes and speaks to him. And the revelation that is given is that there's a kingdom coming. They're going to be, every other kingdom is going to fall. But there is a kingdom coming that will be an eternal king. And there will be one king over that kingdom who will reign forever and ever. You read throughout this and you find that these were people who were, who were people of prayer, who were people of the word of God, who were people of worship and devotion. And what happens to us? Our courage is strengthened. Our ability to stand is improved. 
our faithfulness to God, it is more and greater when we spend time with God. And how do we spend time with God? We do it in prayer. We do it in devotion for God. Somebody from our church sent me a little, a little saying today. It said this, the more we pray for other people, the less we have to pray for ourselves. What he meant is that, that everybody's going to pray for us when we pray for others, and we have spent time with God. We, we must spend time in the presence of God. We must be people who who follow the word of God and are obedient to his word. And when we do that, then we are ready for whatever's going to happen because you don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knew about 2020, and you and I do, do not know what will happen tomorrow. But we can know this, that we, when we spend time in the presence of God, he will have prepared us. When we yield ourselves to God and say to him, God, I want to belong to you, I want to live for you, and I want to serve you, God will be there and God will show up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't know whether God was going to deliver or not. But they knew God was going to be with them. Remember famously, at the end of this, Nebuchadnezzar looks in the fire. And he doesn't see three men. He sees four men. And he says something like this, and one of them is like the sons of the gods. It's about the only way a lost person could describe it. But you and I, we know who was in the fire. And that's the promise to all of us, that God will be in the fire with us, that God will be in the fight with us, that God will be present and that we can depend on him. And when we spend time in the presence of God, then we get ready for whatever comes in our lives. The second thing that helps us to be devoted is the teaching and example of godly parents. Now, I simply cannot overemphasize the importance of godly parents, of what godly parents do in our lives and what they give to us that we sometimes don't even recognize. We can't see, we can't perceive, we can't understand. And so many of you are saying, I wish I'd had godly parents. Absolutely, of course you do. But let me put it this way. Even though you don't have godly parents, you can be a godly parent. Even though you don't have an example, you can have an example. And you will find tremendous blessing in that in your growth the same God will be with you who will be with every other person. You're not going to always get it right as a parent. It's just not going to happen. But you can seek with the help of God to be all that you can be for the glory of God. By the way, how do I know that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had godly parents? Well, there are two things. Number one is the way they reacted because these men and Daniel were taken into exile when they were teenagers at best. Maybe not teenagers. They're taken into exile very young. I see a lot of 12-year-olds here right now. I see a lot of 14-year-olds right now. Those were the ages of Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah when they went into exile. And they stood the test Something had to be there. And I think if you just look at it and look at life, it had to be godly parents. There's a second reason I say they were godly parents, and that was their names. Because their names weren't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were given to them by their pagan masters. They were pagan names. My, uh, my major professor in Hebrew said this. He said, if... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had known that we were calling them by pagan names, they would be spinning in their graves. What were their names? 
Hananiah, the yah on the end is the shortened form of the name Yahweh. They named their children with God in mind. And, and Hananiah means, has to do with what Yahweh does. Azariah's parents did the same. Remember how we got that name? Moses said, God said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, well, Lord, what is your name? And God gave him the name Yahweh, the Lord. So Hananiah's parents and Azariah's parents named him in that way. What about Mishael? Well, the name Mishael, the E-L on the end, is the shortened form of the name Elohim. In the same sense that I talk about God, that is Elohim. And when I talk about the Lord, it is either Jesus or it is Yahweh that we're talking about. And so they named their children. And what were they doing? They were pointing their children toward God. They were reminding them. And everything, there's nothing as precious as our names. And every time they thought about their names, they had to think about Yahweh. They had to think about Elohim. And their names indicate to us that they were godly parents. I cannot overestimate the importance of godly parents. And so here's what I'd like for everybody here to do. I may, I may not have godly parents, but I can be a godly parent. I may not have an example, but I can be an example. When parents teach their children, there's a promise that comes up. Train up a child in the way he shall go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Be faithful, be obedient, be prayerful, commit your children to the Lord. You make devoted people by the teaching and example of godly parents. A third thing that makes for devoted people is the influence of faithful churches. And what is a faithful church? Why did I Why did I use an adjective there? What is a faithful church? I would say it is a church that takes God and all the things of God seriously. We know a lot of people today who who put themselves in the place of God. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. He became God. I've got got an idol here. You've got to worship it. When you hear the music, you fall down and worship the idol. I'm God. I'm in the place of God. I'm bigger than God. And there are a lot of people today who live that way. I am God. I am my own God. I can do whatever I want to do. What is a faithful church? A faithful church is obedient unto Christ. A faithful church reads Scripture and follows Scripture. A faithful church doesn't say, let me tell God what the Bible means. A faithful church says, let God tell me what the Bible means. It's not for me to tell God how I'm going to live. It's for God to tell me how he wants me to live. And so in all of the things of life that has to do with with greed and has to do with racism and has to do with prejudice and has to do with anger and has to do with marriage and morality and all of those things, we we go to Scripture. I I love this. I said this a minute ago. I love this because here, here are these three Hebrew men. They say, your majesty, they are they are respectful. Christians ought to be respectful. They are respectful. They are reasonable. But they are determined not to put a man before God, not to put themselves before God. They call him your majesty, and then they say, but we want you to know we serve the God of God's We serve the the king whose kingdom is eternal, and we will not bow down before your gods. By the way, it's, it's it's no surprise 
And it's not unusual to realize that, wait a minute, there are three of these guys. Not one, not two, there are three of these guys. And the very fact that they are three of them means that they are much more likely to stand in the day of persecution and oppression. And so what would I, what would I say to do? Find two friends, meet together, let's all pray. Let's all determine that we're going to be faithful and obedient to God. I'll pray for you. You pray for him. I'm a man, so I'm putting it mailed here. I'll pray for you. You pray for him. He'll pray for me, and I'll pray for you. It is amazing what happens when you put three people together and they make a pact, an agreement. The proverb says a, a cord of three strands is not easily broken because it is, it is wrapped around each other and all three are pulling together. It's not one person, it is three people who are pulling together. Because of that, the influence of faithful churches makes a real difference. Teaching children makes a real difference. We try to put it before you. The goal of the church is to reach the next generation for Christ. We simply cannot overestimate the influence of godly, faithful churches. Fourth thing that makes for devoted people, these men prepared for the storm before the storm. They knew what they were going to do when the storm came. It's interesting. Uh, they probably prayed about it, but you know what? There's nothing in chapter 3 that says that they prayed about, we're going to stand. We're not going to worship your gods, and we're not going to bow down. Nothing in there about that. They knew what they were going to do. They prepared ahead of time. They prepared ahead of time in prayer, in Scripture, in devotion to God, in worship. They prepared ahead of time, and they were ready. The fifth thing that you have to do is you have to put God above everything else. That's so elementary, isn't it? It is so basic. It is so to the point. You have to come to a place in your life when you say, God, I, I'm in. I'm in for you. I'm ready to stand. I shall not bow down before pagan gods. I bow down to you. I worship you. I am devoted to you. I give myself for you and your service. Live on the North Shore or planning to visit? Join us here at First Baptist Church Covington for one of our three weekend services. Come be encouraged by Dr. Bailey every Saturday evening at 6 or Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. For more information and directions to our church, visit fbccov.org. First Baptist Church Covington. Experience life-changing relationships. Be sure to tune in again next week for Foundation for Life.